Hello and uh, welcome to the FAIR Digital Finance Forum session today uh, on Open Finance, where we'll be talking about how we can unlock innovation and empower consumers. And today is part of the theme for the conference that digital finance is data protected and private. So I just want to welcome you today and say thank you very much for coming. Um, we have a chat function so and a Q&A function, so please add your questions there uh, for the panel. Um, we would be delighted to, to take your questions. We've got some amazing speakers today. and just want to thank them for, for coming along. Some of them are not feeling uh, too well. Some of them are, are up very early and some of them are dealing with hotter than usual weather. So just to uh, say thank you to our panelists. Um, but do use the chat box, introduce who you are, which organisation you're from, and uh, where you're joining from, and we would love to love to uh, hear hear your questions as well. So, just in terms of um, an introduction for me, I'm Faith Reynolds. I am a strategic advisor to government, industry, and the not-for-profit sector. I have a bit of a portfolio career, uh, and I typically focus on consumer issues, uh, financial services, technology, and regulation. So um, as part of uh, my role until May last year, I was the independent consumer representative at the Open Banking Implementation Entity. So I have followed the journey through Open Banking uh, quite closely and, uh, and know the variations of APIs and technology perhaps a little bit more than I might have envisaged at the beginning of that process. Um, I now um, um, uh, do a number of non-exec roles. So I'm on the Payment Systems Regulator Board, I am a non-exec for the current account switch service, check people switch their current accounts. And I'm also a non-executive director for Fair for All Finance, which is an organization that uses dormant assets, so money that companies haven't been able to reconnect with their owners, and uses that to promote financial inclusion by helping scale up and grow the affordable financial, uh, affordable credit sector. So, but that's enough about me. Uh, what we really want to hear about is, is, is open finance and what this session is about. What is it and why does it matter? Well, for those of you who are new to the subject, open finance allows a consumer to give permission to third parties like fintechs to access their account so that those fintechs can provide innovative and useful services. Um, people and small businesses can give their consent to a third party to access their data or make a payment or other transaction on their behalf. It sounds a bit scary uh, to give somebody or give a fintech access to your account, but, um, but there are controls around that. So imagine if you are applying for a mortgage or for credit, you might be asked to prove that you can repay the loan. You might be asked for proof of income. Uh, you might be asked, for instance, to send in three months bank statements. I'm currently remortgaging and I have been asked to send three months bank statements. Well, open finance uh, simplifies that. So with open banking, you could simply consent, give my consent to a fintech to, to access that data directly from the bank on my behalf, and then to share that with the provider or to use it themselves as the, as the credit provider. So it's simple and it's secure and it's convenient. Um, so yeah, so it kind of makes things make things a bit slicker, a bit more convenient. So okay, so why still does that matter? Where I've not really heard about open banking, I've not seen it on the streets, my banks aren't talking about it. What is it? Well, it's a growing phenomenon and very much associated with the development of fintech, um, increasing innovation and competition through access to data. In some countries like Mexico, it's seen as a driver of financial inclusion. There are around 60 countries worldwide who are involved in open banking initiatives, and they're just popping up everywhere. So Australia, China, India, the US, Bahrain, Nigeria, Italy, Brazil, UK, and so on. There are lots of countries currently looking at how do they uh, deliver open banking, which is a shortened term for transaction data from your current account or your, your, your bank account, or open finance, which is kind of like, okay, well, I could take data from my credit account or I have my mortgage account or my pensions account and share that. Or kind of some call it open life or smart data where actually you could also take data from other spaces like energy sector. So in Australia, they've started with energy. How can I share my energy data 
How can that be used by other organisations to, to help um, create cheaper bills for me? Or how can it be used by organisations to plan um, and look at how they can uh, develop low carbon technology and retrofit housing associations with? Um, so it's all about how do we open up data and how do we use that both for social good and for private gain? So APIs, application program interfaces, are the technology that underpin how fintechs interact with the bank or other financial institution that the consumer has an account with. And the design of those APIs is crucial in ensuring that data can be protected and private. In some countries like Brazil and Australia, initiatives have been led by regulation. And that might mean that there are particular API standards, security profiles that companies should be adhering to. In the UK, it means that fintechs have to be registered with the regulator and that banks have to, whether they want to, provide APIs. Um, most use the UK Open Banking Standard, which levels the playing field for fintechs because they can more easily integrate with multiple banks. So this concept of standards can be quite helpful in, in developing a competitive uh, framework. Um, the regulation that we have in the UK and the standard also mean that there's no need for the fintech to create a contract with the bank to access the consumer's data. So as long as I consent, the bank is duty bound to provide that data to the fintech. But that's not the same everywhere. And there are variations on this. So in some countries like the US, um, they've been doing this stuff for years and it's been industry led and the industry is right at the forefront. But it's been built around contracts. There has to be some way to govern that relationship of data sharing. So contracts between a fintech and a bank. So it sounds a bit, bit complicated. What does it mean for the consumer? When it's delivered well, open finance is a fantastic opportunity for creating more personalized, convenient and financially inclusive services. It's about the data. Here in the UK, a couple of years ago, I um, wrote a report with colleagues at the Open Banking Implementation Entity, and we conservatively estimated that open banking could be worth as much as 18 billion a year for consumers, not for firms, but for consumers. How much value could they get from open, open banking? And the financial value that they could get came from fintechs helping people to reduce their household costs. And obviously that's become even more pertinent today as we look at the, the rise in cost of living standards. It also come from helping people access credit at a reduced cost, perhaps helping people access credit for the first time to smooth income. Um, also helping people develop financial cushions through saving or getting better returns on their savings. So open banking can be used to help automate micro savings into another account. But we also found it's not just the financial value that open banking can help with, but also financial health and well-being. And that's really important here because with data, fintechs and other institutions can provide services which are much more personalised, which look at removing barriers to, to products like credit, but also kind of help personalise products so that they can help prompt people to get advice perhaps to stop people getting into uh, over indebtedness. They can prompt people to get advice earlier, or even in the case where people have money but aren't using it, how can they get better returns on that? It can give people greater visibility over their finances and greater control. So lots of stuff to talk about. Um, open finance offers lots of opportunity, uh, but how do we do that? How do we unlock it safely and securely? So we have a brilliant panel. Uh, lined up. And so I'm just going to uh, come out to the panel and just uh, ask you to introduce yourselves. So I think, Arushi, if I, if I start with you, would you just like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Faith, for having me. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Well, I'm Arushi Goel, and I lead data policy and blockchain initiatives at the World Economic Forum. Um, I'm a lawyer by profession. Well, at the forum on the data policy side, I'm currently engaged in a global initiative, which is Data for Common Purposes, where our key focus is to enable data sharing between public and private sector for common good. Um, on the blockchain side, I'm currently leading our regulatory work stream for a digital currency governance consortium, 
which is a consortium of almost 85 organizations across the world, where we are exploring the transformation of our global financial systems uh, due to the emergence of the three currencies. That's brilliant. Thank you, Rishi. Um, Duncan, do you want to go next? Sure. Again, thanks, Sifri, um, for having me today. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Duncan Coburn. I'm the founder and CEO of OneBanks. I'm sure many of you haven't heard of OneBanks. It's a, it's a fintech organisation based in Scotland, in the UK, and we've been built to drive financial inclusion. I'm passionate about financial inclusion and how we can use technology to help people's lives and open finance, open data, open banking is a great ways to do that. And what One Banks does is brings that to life. Um, One Banks is a shared infrastructure bank branch. So um, we bring together all of the services from your underlying bank and provide that in a single location. So instead of having to go in different directions to do everyday banking, you can have it all in a convenient location using the latest technology. Um, so that's what one bank says, and I'll come on to explain it in a wee bit more, a wee bit more detail shortly. That's great. Thank you, Duncan. Um, Benny, do you want to just introduce yourself? Thanks, Faith. Hi, everybody. Uh, very nice to be here. Uh, I'm Benny Chok. I head the Future of Finance Initiative at Thwara Research. Uh, my day job gives me an opportunity to understand the barriers that low-income users face in uh, interfacing with digital finance or digital social protection. So really, my task is to understand customer protection risks that come from digitization of finance and how might providers solve for them. Uh, very excited to be here. Thanks. Brilliant. And Justin. Hey, thanks. I'm Justin Brooklyn. Thanks for inviting me to the, to the forum. Um, I'm here on behalf of Consumer Reports. We're an 85-year-old uh, consumer advocacy organization here in the United States. I head up our work on technology policy, so do a lot of work on uh, competition issues, broadband support, um, algorithmic bias and platform accountability, um, and then privacy, which is what I'm going to be mostly talking about here today, where we try to enact um, privacy legislation here in the United States. We put pressure on companies to do a better job um, protecting pers uh, people's personal information, um, pushing regulators to be um, more protective with the existing laws that we have right now. So um, thanks for inviting me and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Justin. And just to, to say thank you to those who have joined us, I can see Roxana and Kamal and Shah, another Kamal and Kimera and Glenn uh, and Matt obviously with us as well. So thank you. Thank you guys for sharing uh, your names and your organisations in the chat. It's, it's great to have you with us. Um, so I, I, it'd be great, um, Arushi, if you could perhaps get us started. I've elaborated a little bit on um, the opportunities of open finance mm -hmm. for empowering consumers, but um, can you tell us a bit more about um, why open finance is so important and really why our audience should be paying attention to it today? Sure. Um, thank you, Faith, for the question. Um, you know, as you, as you mentioned, open finance has this potential uh, to transform the way we access and use our financial services. Uh, fundamentally, it's based on a principle that as a consumer, the data is owned and controlled by me and can be reused only with my explicit consent. Uh, in fact, you mentioned a number about 18 billion is uh, what you mentioned as a value for the consumer. Well, purely in economic terms, um, there are estimates that open financial data could impact economies such as the UK, the US, uh, or even the European Union by almost one to 1.5% 1 of GDP. And for India, in fact, the estimation is even higher, which is about four to five percent of GDP. Uh, purely from a social lens, open finance would enable financial inclusion, uh, especially for the unbanked and the underbanked population. A lot more choices for the consumers, and as a result, a lot of innovation that comes into the ecosystem. I think what's what's really valuable within open finance is that. Uh, data from multiple touch points, not just the banking data, even your insurance, investments, utility data, or even cryptocurrency transactions, they could all be shared in a trusted manner to provide 
customized tailor-made solutions for one's financial needs. Let me, let me just cite an example here. So at the forum, we are currently working with a state government in India to pilot a data exchange in the agriculture sector. Now, one of the key use cases that we are focused on is smart credit. Why we are doing that? Well, access to institutional credit is quite a challenge for farmers. Uh, one of the reasons is unavailability of information, which can help a financial institution to manage its risk in providing appropriate financing. However, if there's a data exchange where various public and private sector entities that hold a farmer's data, and this data could be anything, right? It could be soil health, crop yield, uh, consumption of agriculture inputs, even something like electronic warehousing receipts. All of this data, if this can be shared with explicit consent of the farmer, this could be used to assess credit worthiness of the farmer and therefore it will just unlock a lot of financial opportunities that were earlier not available. Similarly, open financial data could benefit small businesses in accessing financing services uh, even where robust banking data may just not be available. So seeing the way open finance could create environmental, social, or economic benefits, I, I believe it's safe to say that we, we start to need paying attention to open finance. That's brilliant, Arish. I, I, I think I was looking recently in, uh, at some um, initiatives in uh, Latin America, and I think in Brazil, um, there's a similar kind of initiative looking, not at such a, a public you know, data exchange, but at least a, a fintech that's looking at how can we gather data to help provide uh, microcredit into into the agricultural sector. So really, um, very important uh, in in different countries. Um, Duncan, can you can you just tell us a bit about how one banks and how it works and how you're using it to help empower consumers? Sure, absolutely. So as I said, one banks was started really to drive. Um, the use case of open banking and try and involve everybody. Because one thing that frustrated me is, as you said, people can't see it on the high street. The banks aren't always talking about it. So what is it and how can everybody get involved in it? So what we did is bring it to life and have that physical representation that people can go to and get involved with. Um, people still, all, a lot of people still like doing their banking in person and therefore having somewhere convenient that they can go and to speak to and understand more about open banking helps with that engagement. So. Um, well, 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 how one banks uses open banking is somebody can come to a one banks kiosk um, they can speak to somebody and they can view the different accounts balances and transactions so they can share their consent for one banks to view their accounts data um, balances and initiate payments as well so we can we can enable withdrawals uh, and withdrawal cash we can enable deposits through them sharing their account information for us to facilitate a deposit um, but also simply just viewing the accounts balances and transactions and also that educational experience that I think is really important combining a new technology with um, with that trust that that in-person experience gives you um, so 10 percent of our customers over the last two years never had online banking before signing up to one banks which shows that actually having that in-person experience really helps drive that adoption with open banking. And fundamentally what open banking does, it decentralizes the, the relationship with them, um, with the customer. So instead of the bank always being the face of the customer, open banking allows third parties and fintechs to be the face of the customer, which I think is incredibly powerful. And as you said, it unlocks opportunities for innovation and for fintechs to actually drive better customer experiences. And while, a lot of people are thinking about that from a digital perspective. It's just as important to think about that from a physical perspective as well, because people still like that face-to-face -face interaction. How can you use open banking um, where people always go to a high street branch? Actually, you don't need to go to that branch anymore. You can go to a shared infrastructure um, branch where you can do all of your banking irrespective of who you bank with in that one single location. So what's really exciting is this is a solution which not only is um, good for the banks because it reduces their costs but it also as I said it really empowers customers because it helps drive that engagement with open banking and as we continue to develop I'm excited about the um, how we'll progress with open finance and open data to continue to add to our services to continue to support customers as best as possible and continue to drive engagement with people who wouldn't otherwise be involved with um, 
with open banking. So ultimately, going back to the initial question is what is One Banks? One Banks is a technology platform. And what's exciting is we can deploy that in any setting. It can be a full bank branch, it can be a kiosk setting, um, it can be big, small, completely dependent on what the community needs um, and that service requirement of the community. Using open banking and the latest technology allows us to make changes dependent on what the community want. And I think that, that um, is really exciting as we continue to use open banking to empower people. I think I think you're right, Duncan. It's, it is, and um, just here in the UK, for, for those of you that are perhaps less familiar with the context, we are seeing lots of banks um, shutting branches, uh, which means that people who rely on access to cash or who just don't have kind of digital reception where they are, it's, it's really hard for them to kind of like um, transact in the way that they want to. Um, and I think just this week we saw HSBC close another 69. Uh, branches in in the UK. So I think it is important that we um, that we think about sort of you know how can we use technology and how can we bridge that digital divide. So um, Benny, I want to come to you next. Hopefully uh, you can still hear me. <laughs> oh. Sorry, Faith. Was that a question for me? Ah, yes, there was good. I'm sorry that my, it just went, you all froze and I lost you for a moment. Sorry, it was the reception. But Benny, it would be great if I do have a question for you. Um, in terms of, you know, how it's shaping up in India, can you tell us a bit about how well it's, how well it's working there? Yeah, um, I think it's a little too early to comment on how well it's working, but I can kind of paint the landscape of how we are approaching uh, open finance. Uh, can I get a quick sound check? Some of you are frozen for me. I'm not sure if I'm audible. Great, thank you. I can hear you. Uh, I yeah, can hear I'm you. I'm in and out a bit, but I can hear you. <laughs> Uh, so I think in India, we've taken three approaches towards uh, open banking, and of them, the most significant one is perhaps the account aggregator system. Uh, for those of us who might not really know what account aggregator is, it's a very bespoke Indian version. It's a crossover between consent manager and open banking in some sense. So what an, what an account aggregator does is it is really an institution and the RBI is giving out licenses. The Central Bank of India is giving out licenses uh, for that institution. And what the account aggregator does is it allows for exchange of information between let's call them requesters of financial information and the institutions that have that information, so providers of that information. And all of this happens with the consent of the consumer. So in some sense, they've brought in the idea of open banking, but have uh, retained the control very much with the consumer in that the consumer has to actively consent to that transfer of data. So that's a very interesting concept. Uh, it, I think the licenses have been around, or at least the framework has been around for five years, but account aggregators went live, a couple of them only September last year. So it's still too early for us to say how effective that has been, but some of the things, obviously, to just echo what the rest of you have been saying is it is a massive opportunity. It obviously improves the competition amongst financial service providers because now relationship banking is no longer uh, a correlation of how long you have banked with a particular institution. It's, it's that much more fungible and that much more shareable across providers. And of course, this whole new opportunity that comes with fintech providers uh, coming into the fray. And I think fintech in India holds a massive promise. It does everywhere in the world, but especially in India, because uh, we do understand that uh, even though the problem of access to financial services in India has been solved, which is to say that we've made great uh, kind of strides in making a bank account available to the lower uh, income segment through our policy initiatives of the central government, we do see that that access has not really converted into usage. So what that means is even though everybody does have access, most accounts tend to lay dormant, uh, they're on the verge of inactivity uh, transactions in the last year are few to name if at all and what that means is uh, that that bank account is not really acting as a gateway to that relationship banking that can then open uh, you know pathways to other financial services and their fintech becomes very important because like we all agree they have this uh, kind of ability to uh, infer financial information from seemingly less financial information or just you know personal behavior and a lot of other indicators 
providers. And that, that's very helpful from our network. For instance, we know that some fintech providers, their portfolio is as much as 33% new to bank. So the first ping in the credit bureau is actually by the fintech provider. So it, it shows the ability of fintech to reach the underserved, the new to banking and provide financial services. And to that extent, sharing of information would only improve uh, you know, the possibility or the probability of people accessing finance. But again, these are very early days for us to actually be commenting on uh, where it's working and what is it that we need to get better at. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And, and Benny, I just wanted to follow up because I think, um, I, I'm sorry, because I have, I've been a bit in and out, so I haven't been able to hear everything you said. But um, I know when we talked previously, and we were, we were looking at this, this subject, we talked about sort of um, the, the fact that people are also sharing government to access um, social protection. And I just wondered, how, is, how well is that working for consumers? Is, is that working kind of positively or, or how do you, where are some of the challenges? So I think uh, in India, we are very much, uh, we, we are at the stage where we are digitizing social protection uh, almost on scale. And what I mean by that is across the different states in the country, there is a move to create a digital registry or a digital database and that has a lot of information that is relevant for the government so the government would use this database to actually identify who are the beneficiaries who who is eligible for an entitlement so for instance if you are a widower if you're an if you're a member of the unorganized group so there's a wide range of information that goes in at the family level because there are several social protection schemes uh, that uh, that look to address different kinds of vulnerabilities vulnerabilities of employment vulnerabilities of health or just your social status you're coming from a lower caste or you're coming from a kind of underprivileged background so th those kinds of things and so their data sharing is happening very much at the state level and uh, it's a government to citizen contract it is not so much a consumer lens that a person is wearing but it's very much a state contract to say that the citizen and government contract what is interesting there uh, which also came up in arushi's uh, talk is that that database itself provides a lot of opportunity for financial service providers to provide customized credit. So for instance, if we have a database for agriculture uh, or farmers in the country and one such database is actually in the making, then what that would do is people would be able to see seasonality of crops, cyclicality of crops, yield, all of that. And they would be able to provide better credit to the farmer. And I think that's where it's, it gets really interesting because there is a lot of value that can be added, but that also shifts the narrative from it being a state citizen contract to a very much a market-based contract between a customer and a potential financial service provider. And I think there we have to be a bit more more careful about how the same database is being made available, if it can actually be made available, and what are the extra safeguards that you need to deploy when uh, a, you know, a, a private financial service provider is interfacing with the database that was initially collected by the government. And I'm sure Ar Arushi has a lot of thoughts on this, uh, and we'll get to, get to it in the other part of the uh, talk. Thanks so much, Benny. And that's fascinating, isn't it? So what starts out as consumers sharing their data with a government for sort of particular service, actually the purpose of that data seems to change and then it can be shared with other institutions. I mean, um, Justin, uh, this is obviously in your ballpark. I mean, people are, you know, in this situation, people are sharing their data with third parties, sometimes to access vital services. Um, how secure and private is, is open banking? What do you think? Yeah, so I think like, you know, my concern is there's not always a lot of legal protections around this data once it's shared. So certainly in, you know, in, in the United States where, where I am, um, not a lot of privacy regulation, not a lot of privacy rules. There are some rules for traditional financial institutions, um, but those often don't apply at all to some of these new startups, um, which give, gives them more flexibility, um, but it also means that they're relatively unconstrained with what they can do with your data once they have it in the first place. Um, so federally, not a lot of legislation. At the state level, we're starting to see more laws passed, but again, they tend to be fairly weak. They put a lot of the burden on the consumer to figure out what's going on. So the default privacy rule in the United States is like, don't lie, right? So don't, 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 don't deceive people, right? And that's good. We should not be deceiving people. Um, but that often means that uh, 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 on privacy, the companies just don't say what they're doing. And so if you actually do try to parse through a privacy policy or go through the disclosures and try to figure out what's going on, 
is, is written by lawyers, it's really evasive, it's, they reserve broad rights, they don't really disclose exactly what they're doing. So it's actually really hard for consumers to evaluate what's going on. So we actually, at Consumer Reports, we actually looked at five different fintech um, apps, try to get a sense of what they're doing, read through all their disclosures, you know, and this, and this is like, <laughs> this took us like several weeks to try to dig through and find out what was going on. And at the end, and even after all this time, we, we did not have a great sense of what was happening. We, 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 we looked at the, at the data disclosures coming up off of our device, and you can see that there's a lot of sharing going on with third parties, you know, company, you know, big companies like Google and Facebook, maybe, and maybe that's okay. Maybe it's just being done for analytics. Maybe it's done for other purposes. The problem is there's just not a lot of information about what's going on. And it's really hard for consumers to evaluate it. Um, one more thing, I think we've heard a lot about consent, right? This is all done with consumers' consent. Um, and some jurisdictions do require more in the way of consent, but, you know, consent, I think, can often be illusory. Like, you know, you, you click OK, what have you agreed to, right? When you go to a website, you, know, you must click OK to proceed. And then you click OK, what have you grant, what, what rights have you granted? Or you, know, you click OK to a, a, a 30 page license agreement. No one has the bandwidth to try to read through all that to try to figure out what's going on. Um, and so I think, you know, I think I, I, I worry about relying too much on consent because again, the, the, the entities that the consumers aren't determining the terms of consent, it's the companies and consumers often just don't have a great sense of what's going on. Yeah, and that's one of the real challenges, isn't it? So um, I just, uh, I, I, I've got a question from the chat, which kind of relates a little bit to your to your area of expertise. Um, it's actually, sorry, in the Q&A, but it, it's talking about, um, so if you've, we've got all this challenge of kind of like um, privacy and consent, but on the security side, how do we protect open banking from becoming kind of new gateway for scams and fraud, which sort of seems to be growing everywhere. So this is from Shah Taylor, and Shah's also just um, put your report that you mentioned into, into the chat as well. And it, I'm just sort of interested in this question because we have people consenting to stuff, but they're not quite sure that they, what they're consenting to. And obviously, this means that bad actors can also then potentially get access to, to information. We see more scams and fraud. What, what's your thought on how, how do we address this? Yeah, so, so on the security side, I, mean, I think we do, to, at least in the, yeah, in the United States, which is my experience, there are security laws and companies that have access to data are required to use reasonable security um, to safeguard it. I think the problem is it's just, it's just under enforced. Um, you know, yeah, we tend to under resource regulators that, you know, um, and even like when there are like, you know, a, a bunch of traditional banks, it's hard enough to stay on top of them when there are, are thousands and thousands of apps. Who's going to do like the you know kicking the tires to make sure that they all use you know reasonable security to protect your data, um, and then like you know that, and that's against you know companies who are trying to do the right thing just maybe aren't um, investing enough resources in security, and then there there is the, the fraud aspect too right and that they, when there are more and more startups which again is good for competition and, and can offer new and innovative uh, uh, services for consumers. Um, there are more potentials for bad actors too, right? There are people who can pop up and just, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a scheme for identity theft. Um, and they, and they get their sharing with more and more third-party partners too. Again, innovation, there's, there's good things around it, uh, but it also increases um, risk as well. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, and again, for consumers, to, you know, they, they, they see this, this service advertised and, it's, and, it, and it seems great. It's really challenging to evaluate. So again, entities like Consumer Reports, we try to um, write services, try to, you know, say, here are the ones that are trustworthy, here are the ones who have better, better policies and whatnot. Um, um, and, and, that's, that, and, that, and that's great. Um, but, you know, but, but consumers don't have access to that kind of uh, evaluation for every service. And so it, do, it does, it can be confusing for, for folks uh, who are trying to figure out, you know, which of these entities are trustworthy or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it feels like a, an area where there is an opportunity there for consumer organizations to think about sort of practical steps they can take to, to help consumers manage some of this sort of this, this, um, this marketplace. And I know we've got another question uh, in the Q&A, which I'll come back to later because it, it fits in with some of our later discussions. So I'll, I'll bring, you, bring you in later um, uh, then, um, uh, oh, it's an anonymous, anonymous person. So I'll bring you in later then. Um, but um, Duncan, just to kind of go back on this sort of thing about what, what do you think is really needed? Where should we be pushing regulators and governments to, to do more? I think it's within the authentication piece. I know we've spoken a lot about the consent and how easy the consent is, which which um, potentially opens up risk. Um, but I think it's within the authentication piece that's, that currently is at risk of excluding a lot of people in the UK. At the moment, the authentication is limited to people who have online banking. And actually, the UK is one of the only places in the EU without 
a standard identity uh, form. And actually, I think open banking is one of the biggest success stories of a federated identity, whereby someone can prove their identity using an existing bank account that they've got which is absolutely phenomenal and I think is really exciting and opens up a huge amount of innovation. However, it does limit it to people who already have online banking. And I think there is a huge amount of untapped potential um, with open banking. And that could be in the form of thinking about how we can merge digital with physical. As I said, that's what One Banks is all about, is bringing that digital technology to life. And actually, if you think about that from an authentication and even consent perspective as well, could you introduce a verbal consent if somebody doesn't have an iPhone and doesn't have um, doesn't have internet, for example, should they be excluded from these benefits that open banking and open finance have? No. And therefore, I think there is more that can be done to push open banking and these consent and authentication towards verbal consent or even chip and pin consent as well. A lot of people still have a bank card. In the UK, there's 20% of people who have got a bank account but don't have online banking. And that is a huge amount of the population that is excluded from making the most of open banking. So I think there's a lot more that can be done there. However, I would stress that the UK has been a good example of implementation of open banking, largely because of the open banking implementation entity and the common standards and the level playing field that that's created, which improves access accessibility for smaller purpose-based fintechs like one banks, and also helps consumers with the trust and familiar familiarity of open banking entities uh, fintechs because the experience is consistent which I think has been important as well. And Justin just sort of reflecting on your you know the other question you just answered in terms of sort of like thinking about security and 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 also sort of what what the laws are I mean do you think there are do you think more is needed um, from kind of regulators and government to help people you know be able to unlock their data more securely and um, what, what's your kind of do you think what kind of duty should there be for firms um what regulations might there be that could just help um you know reduce some of this complexity that people are facing yeah i think you know rather than relying overly on consent people should certainly um you know data should only be shared with people's um uh, at people's direction and with their consent but i think there should just be more outright prohibitions on a lot of adversarial practices all right and think you know traditionally consumers consumer groups always wanted opt-in like only you know opt-in for everything give, give consumers can consent for everything but like i said there's a lot of problems with the consent framework and so i think you're increasingly seeing uh right uh, uh legislation aimed at just actually directly rating in bad practices so there's been a lot of effort in the united states um, and, and, and in Europe as well to ban surveillance advertising. So like, you know, the, the sharing of your data for targeted ads. Um, and, and it's not framed as like opt in to, to, <laughs> to surveillance advertising. It's like, to, let's, let's just shut it down altogether. Um, traditionally banks had, you know, like, um, like fiduciary obligations to kind of act on behalf of the user. And so um, maybe extending those sort of fiduciary like obligations to some of these new FinTech startups too that, there are terms of there, 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 you know, there's a, there's a price you pay, but then after that, the app is working um, on your behalf. Um, you know, certainly limiting a lot of the sharing, you know, sharing the data with um, third parties um, who you haven't told it to, I think is something that should be maybe reined in more directly so that consumers have, can have more trust around it. Um, that's certainly been the, the thrust of a lot of the anxiety about a lot of these apps um, that we've looked at. Thanks, Justin. We've got um, we've we've got a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll I'll come to the second one and I'll come back to the first one. Um, and um, but it says that data protection is not well regulated, mostly in developing countries, that in many cases do not have a general data protection legislation or data protection authority. Um, so what are the ideas panelists have about protecting consumer data and ensuring it's appropriate, informed, and transparent management um, to ensure consumer trust in open banking and in digital financial services generally? Um, I mean, I was just thinking, Arushi, does, is this something that you've got some thoughts about and some ideas about how we can you know, improve and help consumers manage their, manage their consent and their data? Well, um, I mean, what we've been working with um, a lot of tech companies, you know, one bank is here and um, so a lot of tech companies are coming up with uh, solutions that embed some of these uh, principles or regulations uh, where regulations don't exist at least on a principle level or otherwise re regulation itself it's embedded in the very tech stack so 
so that you know as an as a consumer i don't need to go read all the terms and conditions on a website or i i don't want to read all the privacy policies that i come across so i think just that user interface that has to be really simple of how we interact with technology and that could in a way um uh, you know take care of take care of the situation where these kind of regulations do not exist at this point. So that kind of innovation, we are seeing that happening a lot um, in, in different parts of the world. Yeah, yeah I think as it is that, that concept and one of the exciting things, I think as somebody who's been involved in consumer protection, one of the exciting things is being able to uh, build restrictions into the technology. So it doesn't always have to depend on a regulator going around and checking, but the technology itself can put in some constraints. And Benny, do you have sort of some, some ideas on this as well? Yeah, um, very interesting conversation, actually. And I do think that um, it's unfortunate yeah. India is one of those countries where we do not have a general data protection regulation uh, thus far. We've been at it for a couple of years, but it's still in the coming. Uh, but in the meanwhile, digital financial services need to expand for the various reasons, for the various benefits that they bring to the people. And I think the way we reconcile that vacuum, and that's that's one step that the regulator in India is trying to take the central bank. Uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to create self-regulatory organizations. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's pretty much true of regulators across the world that they do not have as much capacity as they would need to do a full enforcement and a full supervisory uh, kind of a job. So they all operate in a capacity deficit in a deficit in some sense. And what the Reserve Bank of India is trying to do is create uh, industry bodies, which are SROs, uh, self-regulatory organizations, and then they are responsible for codes of conduct and for compliance to that conduct uh, of the members that subscribe to the SRO. We've, we've done this in the past in the microfinance industry as well. And right now, the recommendation on the table appears to be that there is an SRO, uh, which then regulates anybody who is involved in ancillary credit services. So the core credit service is taking taking the credit risk on your balance sheet and lending. But there's a lot that needs to happen when you get to that stage of lending, right? There is origination, there's underwriting, uh, post-lending, there is recollection. So all of those are categorized as ancillary services. And can these ancillary service providers, which are typically fintech providers, come together in an SRO and then have their own code of conduct? And that code of conduct then goes across several aspects, right? There's data protection, there's data security, their standards for consent. And like Justin mentioned, uh, actually the Indian regulator's imagination is pretty much having fiduciary obligations on that, uh, on that ancillary service provider to make sure that they're acting in the best interest of the consumer. Now, all of that is great on paper, but we do know that, <laughs> we do know that uh, the interests of the consumer and the provider might not always reconcile, right? I mean, data becomes, an, becomes a liability only after it has been leaked. Until then, there is absolutely no price that the organization needs to pay with falling costs of data collection, falling costs of data storage. I mean, the cost of collecting additional data is minimal unless, of course, it's leaked and it can be traced back to you. Both of those are quite hard, right? I mean, it's not very easy to identify when there was a data leak, that's one. And after the data has been leaked, it's impossible for a consumer to say, X organization leaked my data, right? And that, that kind of um, dynamics means that there are actually no real controls on what organizations collect. And that is problematic because uh, I think that we have to be very careful that there are certain non-negotiables, uh, even in the name of inclusion and even in the name of uh, social protection. So people have strict privacy preferences and they would rather not share some kinds of data. And I think it's it's important for us to be mindful of that. And uh, having SROs is great, but also having a very granular understanding of the privacy preferences at the last mile is very important. So I think uh, what the government needs is uh, clever ways of regulating, be it rec tech, be it delegated regulation to SROs, et cetera. But what we also need is a greater understanding among providers themselves that what data is necessary and what data is not, and then kind of arriving at an understanding and hopefully abiding by it. Thanks, Benny. I think it's, um, it, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? Looking at what we do on paper versus what gets, what happens in practice. I know this, this conundrum, but, and Duncan, I just wonder if you could speak very briefly, just mention um, consent dashboards and perhaps how those work in, in the UK to help people control, control their data. 
consent dashboards. So yes, um, the ability for a consumer to be able to withdraw consent at any point of time, I think is really important because it gives that ability, again, for the consumer to always be in control of the data such that if they do change their mind uh, further down the line, they can withdraw that consent and they have the right to understand how the data has been used. And um, I think that's working really well in the UK and um, is a good way for the consumer to always be on top of the data. Um, it's a practical, it's just a practical tool, isn't it? That when you've given consent, actually being able to go somewhere within your, uh, within your bank or within your, the kind of TPP to, to be able to see, oh, this is data that I'm handing over, this is what I'm giving. It's quite a, a useful tool. We've got a couple of other questions. So Justin, I'm going to come to you um, next on, on, on a question, which is taking, actually, it's interesting, Benny, just listening to you about how data gets moved and transferred through data chains and the liability even in the UK, we've still got some challenges about where does data end up, and uh, one of the places it can end up is is, is in kind of like the hands of marketeers. So, um, just thinking about this this question about how do we define surveillance advertising, Justin? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm sorry, I should I should have been more clear about that in the first place. So, yeah, it's like traditional advertising, right? Like you know, like on, on a billboard or on TV, like generally not targeted directly to me. Um, I think I don't, most people don't generally have a problem with it. Then people kind of have an invasive or a, a detailed view into your life and then can tailor the advertisements directly to you that some people find somewhat off-putting. Um, you know, the example of search advertising, I think is generally thought of as okay. If I go to Google, for example, and search for lawnmowers, and then like the first result is an ad for a lawnmower company. Well, that's kind of a contextual, that's kind of understandable. They know I'm looking for lawnmowers right now. Um, it's that later, if like two weeks later, if you're if you're on a news site <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get an ad for, for lawnmowers, I'm like, well, how, how do they know that I was interested in lawnmowers? Or you're shopping, the, the prototypical example is you're shopping for shoes and then those shoes kind of follow you around the web and, and often different devices um, for the next several weeks, which I think you know, people find um, so, somewhat off-putting. And you know, in the case of, of finance, you know, they have they have really detailed information, or they can have very detailed information about how much money you have, um, what you're you know what you're willing to pay for things, uh, what you're interested in, your purchase history, and so that information could well be mined to then share with marketers about the sort of things that you're more likely to interact with when you're surfing on the web or using apps, or even increasingly on smart. TVs as well. And some people might be totally fine with that. Some people like, yeah, sure, show me, show me things that are of, of interest to me. Um, I think most people tend to find it invasive and, and abusive. And so I think that that's why, I mean, and you know, that's honestly driven most of the privacy debate in the US and maybe maybe overseas as well. Um, with big big tech companies having this, these detailed profiles about you to try to manipulate you to buy things. Um, and again, I'm not, and I, I don't really think it's that it has been a huge issue issue in, in the fintech space yet. I don't think they're definitely mining all this data to sell to marketers. But we also don't know because, again, there, there isn't that level of transparency. There aren't those legal obligations where companies are pro prohibited from doing it or disclosing it or, 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 or being more clear about it. And so I think that is some hesitancy that some consumers have about giving you know this, these startups who knows uh, whether, whether they're trustworthy or not access to such detailed and personal information. Oh, thanks, thanks for that, Justin. And I just, uh, just sort of put, um, following up, I, we do have a question um, on how consumer advocates and regulators can help mitigate. I'm going to come to this question at the at the end because I know this is something that uh, uh, we we kind of prepared for and we've got some more ideas on. But um, just taking uh, another question from Shah, what would make it easy for fintech companies to systemize uh, consumer protection? So, um, Arisha, I didn't know if you wanted to um, to respond to that question. Sorry, I think I was. Uh, you wanted me to respond to the, the question. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. There's, there's a question in the chat, which is, what would make it easy for? Oh. Okay. All right. Sorry. Like, that's. The yeah. Thing I, I, I think what would make it easy. Um. I mean, a mandate from the top always makes it very easy to systemize any sort of consumer protections. Uh, I mean, the recent EU Data Act, right? It just said manufacturers have to have their. Um, uh, whatever they are developing, it has to be in a certain manner where the data is easily accessible by the user and the manufacturer. So uh, if the regulator is saying that, the government is saying that it's very easy for the company to go ahead and do it. Uh, aside from that, I think the general environment currently where there is definitely more awareness 
of data protection and how we can use data to drive value for everyone. I see a lot of that conversation happening. And because of that, there's a lot of innovation in the space, right? There are people who want to be able to monetize that opportunity as well while providing a solution that that's kind of beneficial and that kind of adheres to, uh, to all these system protections. Um, so yeah, that, that, that would be my two cents um, on that question. Thanks, Rishi. That, that's great. And so, I mean, I think if we kind of um, just sort of uh, come towards sort of thinking about uh, wrapping up, we've got the last last 10 minutes. Um, data sharing sort of, it, it, it feels quite a minefield of, of, of data protection laws to take on board and uh, and then also sort of thinking about the financial context and then things like APIs and technology stacks, you know, it's, it's quite challenging, isn't it? So I just wondered if we could perhaps um, answer this, this, this question we've got here and um, more recently um, of, of these new fintech companies, particularly around things like terms and conditions. And, uh, and I've got some, some, some thoughts on um, some other work that I'm involved with at the company called Amplify Global, but I'll, I'll come to that last. But um, I, I don't know, um, Duncan, um, do, you, do you want to um, just kick us off? Sorry, Faith, I missed the first, first part of that. Oh, I was just saying, it would be great if you were able to answer the question in the chat about how consumer advocates and regulators can help mitigate and reduce the power asymmetry. So how can, how can consumer organisations help um, create more consumer-friendly, open finance ecosystems? I think um, standardising an approach and making sure a lot of companies do it in the same manner. I think one thing that um, is important when it comes to it is trust and actually fintechs are there to help the consumers and they do that for like they can do that for a long time but whenever the consumer thinks that they've they've used the service or they're, they're not getting the benefit from it, it's so important to have that ability to be forgotten and to have the data sort of deleted and removed from that organization. And I think that um, that two-way conversation is, is you're giving consent to use the data, but at the same time, you're receiving that benefit. And then if, if that stops at all, that ability to sort of stop and remove the data is really important. Um, so coming back to the question specifically, uh, how can regulators help reduce the power of symmetry? Again, I think it is dictating those standardized terms and helping fintechs um, have that level playing field is the main thing. That's great. And then, um, moving to Benny, what are your thoughts on this question? How can we empower? Um, so I think on the consult on the consumer organization, actually, I just want to mix up the question a bit, if that's okay. Uh, I was quite intrigued by the question on what can fintech providers themselves do and maybe then kind of address what is it that consumer organizations can do. Uh, fintech providers themselves, I suppose, uh, Duncan makes a great point on trust and we really think that the gap between access and usage is that of trust, right? If I'm able to trust a service, then if it's available to me, I'd definitely take it up. And I think in India, we're finding a few ingredients of that trust. We think that an effective grievance redressal mechanism is a must. And uh, our work on the field is finding that even though, uh, you know, the uh, the transaction itself might be digitized. The grievance redress mechanism may not be the top priority for a provider, and therefore it kind of often gets overlooked. And the grievance redress pro process is often onerous, lengthy, long turnaround times, uh, which is kind of a huge cost on those who already are kind of, you know, short of resources. And we found that that to be kind of a factor that dissuades people from digital financial services generally, because there is no kind of ability to hold someone on the hook right away. There is no physical interface, touch point, so on and so forth. So I think grievance redress would be important. Second, what Duncan says, and we are finding in our work that a lot of our, a lot of the innovations around us are smartphone first, first and there is still a lot of population that is still on feature phones and don't have smartphones, right? And we really need to kind of design for that group if we want to realize financial inclusion via digital. So that's the second kind of thing. And the third kind of thing is uh, just data protection. 
I mean, sometimes the gap is, uh, sometimes it's, it's a bit of a gray zone and uh, it's hard for providers to understand what is uh, right and what is wrong. And that's completely appreciated. But sometimes the difference is not so much, right? So for instance, once I have deleted the app, why are there you know, uh, things in the SDK that are still collecting data from my phone? I mean, that, that's a clear signal of end of relationship. So why would you still continue to track the consumer or not delete their data? Like those kinds of uh, hygiene points are kind of important when it comes to fintech. And very quickly on what regulators can do, I've, I've touched it in the past. Uh, there is room for delegated regulation, but also reg tech. One thing that we have to understand is that risk proportionate reg tech is important because we don't want to regulate fintechs for risks that they don't create right that's expensive that's jarring and that stifles innovation so you really only want to regulate them for the risks that they create and you want to do it in a way that is as nimble as their operations it's impossible to think that there'd be a paper-based filing for an organization that has gone completely tech end to end right so i think there is that bit of learning curve that regulators are also finding themselves at that how do you be as clever and as swift in regulation as the products themselves are Thanks very much, Benny. That's great. So we've got um, just five minutes left. So I thought it'd be uh, useful just for um, perhaps uh, Justin and Arushi have, who haven't managed to get to on this question, just to perhaps um, uh, let us know really what your what your thoughts on what what from today's panel do you most want to convey to our audience? What's the thing that you'd most like them to take away? So maybe Justin, then then Arushi, and I'll do a quick follow follow up. Um, yeah, and so I mean, I, I, I feel like I, I, I've, I've been like the, the, the Debbie Downer of this panel and, and expressing concerns and, 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 and I think real fears, but I do think that it's also very promising technology too. I also um, um, recently refinanced a mortgage. Um, I use a, 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 a fintech startup. Um, I think I, because of it, I had a, I probably had better experience. I, I was able to access better rates, and I think there are very real benefits to consumers to having this, this level of competition. Um, and then kind of going back to the other question, I think you know is um, incumbent upon civil society organizations to try to like um, uh, shine sunlight on some of these um, uh, behaviors in these companies to help educate consumers. You know, not all the burden should be on consumers but I think they should be relatively emp as empowered as they can be to make a lot of the choices for themselves. So, you know, I think there are risks here. I talked about, um, you know, ads is, is, is one thing, but there's also, you know, um, um, you know, this alternative scoring models where companies want access to all of your like personal information and social media and emails. Um, and there's, again, invasive issues there. Um, maybe the, the benefits aren't worth it. There are potential for discrimination, right? Discrimination um, laws that may be evaded but because companies are using algorithmic processing. So, um, you know, uh, we didn't talk about it very much, but price discrimination is a concern. If companies have access to all your information, they know how much you're willing to pay for services. Um, I think more companies will, will have the, the, the will be able to extract relatively more um, value from consumers and, and we will lose out. So a lot of issues need to be addressed over time, but I think um, um, real benefits too. So I think uh, just um, more sunlight, more transparency, and probably a little more rules for the road too. Cool, thank you. And Arushi, a quick final statement to finish us off. And, uh, and I think that I, I will then have to call us to a close promptly. Sure, sure. I think just uh, a kind of a reiteration of everything that's been said. I mean, the, with open finance, what we are finding, uh, the power and control of data, which is, again, data itself is emerging as a very important resource, right? It will increasingly lie with the individual. So as individuals, as fintech providers, as legacy institutions, I think we all have to be very consciously more informed. Uh, a lot more aware and a lot more responsible in how we harness this opportunity for the common good. Thank you so much, Arushi, for being so, uh, so succinct. And I think that's just it, isn't it? We've heard a lot about the opportunities. Data offers so much opportunity, but also uh, the risks as well, which Justin has helped to, to highlight. I think for organisations looking at this, it does take a little bit of effort. It does take a little bit of kind of like, um, a, you know, focus. But actually, it's worth it because uh, finance is becoming ever more data driven, driven. And it's really important that we look for ways to unlock the innovation and empower consumers, but also make sure that their data is protected and remains private. So I just want to say a big thank you for uh, our, our panelists today. Thank you. Um, and thanks for attending. Everybody who arrived to attending. Sorry, there's a green screen flickered. It was very excited exciting but please do follow us on twitter linkedin instagram and facebook and obviously there are sessions happening 
uh, later today. Thank you for your questions and thanks to everybody who contributed. We really appreciate the interaction. So thank you, everybody.